Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by Pete Bombacci, and today we're going to talk about human connections. Pete is the founder of the Jim Well Project. It's a Canadian organization that focuses on making the world a happier and healthier place by reminding people about the importance of face-to-face social connections and how it can be a health benefit. Pete is an expert in the field of human connections, and we're going to be talking about the benefit of human connections as well as the effects of loneliness. Pete, thank you so much for joining me today. Curtis, it's so great great to be here with you, my friend. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm 55-year-old guy who uh, who worked in the for-profit world, had the opportunity to move to not-for-profit and ran a, an organization called Movember, which is a men's health charity focused on growing mustaches in the month of November every year and raising the uh, consciousness of men about the importance of their health, but also in the consciousness of those who love their men and making sure that they understand how important it is for men to take care of their health. In going from for-profit to not-for-profit, I recognize that what really makes me happy is waking up every day and, and trying to help other people. So for the last, now coming on six years, I've been leading the GenWell Project, which is a human connection movement that, you know, our focus is on educating, empowering, and catalyzing people around the importance of face-to-face social connection, because... Curtis, you and I have been educated on exercise and eating well, and we shouldn't smoke. And we've been told that we should get some sleep and told about drinking water. But most of us have never been educated on just how important human connection is for our health, our happiness, our longevity, and frankly, for the betterment of of society as a whole. And that's our message is, you know, we all need to spend more time with each other. Research long before the global pandemic showed that we were more disconnected than ever before. And obviously over the last 20 months, we've been even more disconnected than ever before. And so I've been championing this for about six years. The pandemic has been the the great wake up call for all of us. And it's through conversations like this one we're going to have tonight that really helps spread this message so that we can all be more conscious and intentional about our social connections as we move forward and come out of the global pandemic. Well, tell us about the Gen Well Project. Explain what it is and talk about, you kind of touched a little bit on your mission, but just kind of go a little deeper into it. Yeah, it's, you know, I hate to say it, but it's a simple message. And, you know, human connection has been around since caveman times. And, you know, back then, you know, our whole lives probably existed within a mile of where we were, were born and where we existed pre-pandemic, working up through 70s and 80s, we lived in the greatest growth era in the history of the world, and we started to believe that we didn't need each other in order to get through this, through this world. And I think the pandemic has been the wake-up call. So the reality is the the global connection, the global human connection movement, the Genwell Project is and is trying to champion, is trying to educate people so that we can take more proactive steps to stay socially connected. You know, our message is. The research is clearer than ever before right now that social connection, it's the single largest thing that makes us happy. It reduces anxiety and depression. It increases empathy, compassion, and resilience. And in a world in which we're so torn apart, you know, whether it's by, by uh, the pace and pressure of society, whether it's cultural divides, whether it's the separation of wealth, you know, one of the greatest things we can all do for our the betterment of all of us is spend more time with each other and understand the challenges that each of us face. That's how we build bridges and bonds and understanding. But human connection also strengthens our immune system and our self-confidence. It increases our chances of living longer 
And a new study that's come out even during the course of the pandemic suggests that social connection is the single greatest preventative action that we can all take to avoid depression. But Curtis, you know, most of us were never educated on this. And, and up until the late 1990s, even the early 2000s, we didn't really need to focus on it because most so a lot of the social hap- the social connection all still happened, whether it was at the workplace, maybe it was on the, a little bit on your street, maybe it was at your local community event, or maybe for those that are faith-based, you might have still gone to church. But the reality is the advent of technology, social media, the, the faster pace, the longer commutes, all of that added up to us spending less time together than ever before. And now that we know what the negative implications of spending time apart are, which are, you know, increased risk of heart disease, dementia, diabetes, suicide, anxiety, depression, obesity, and the list goes on of the different type of health implications that come from chronic loneliness. And so our message and our mission is to help educate people, to empower them with tips, tools, and ideas And finally, what we do is we try to catalyze people at least a couple times a year on what we call Genwell weekends. And those are weekends when we want people to make us the excuse and give themselves permission to reach out to people that whether it's because it's somebody you've been meaning to call and you finally have an excuse from us to do it, or maybe it's actually talking to that neighbor that you haven't spoken to for a decade, but you just want to build that bridge before the crisis comes, before the tree falls on your fence or before somebody has a catastrophic health event or a catastrophic weather event, you know, a tornado, a hurricane, you know, right now in in Vancouver and in Canada, they're dealing with floods, you know, the worst time to actually get to know your neighbor is when you're in the middle of the crisis. The better option is to actually build that relationship. So when the crisis comes, we're all prepared. And so whether you want to talk about being prepared for crisis or whether you want to talk about your own health or taking care and building a stronger community, human connection is at the root of every cause, every illness, and every crisis. And if we can build these healthy connection habits before we get to those crises, all of them will all be better off because that's about building resilience that helps us get through the challenging times that life, life brings us. Do you feel like we're facing an epidemic in regards to loneliness? Why, why not? Yeah, I think, you know, again, I'm, I will reiterate what the experts are saying, and they've been saying for some time pre-pandemic that we were already in a crisis and, and an epidemic. And I would suggest that the pandemic has made an even greater crisis and an issue. But I will say this at the same time, Curtis, is I think the pandemic, and this is actually the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, who is truly one of the leaders in fighting or raising the consciousness around the issue of isolation and loneliness, said this recently in a a webinar that I was attending. And he said, this may be the greatest opportunity that we all have to finally do something about this growing issue. Because if it's been growing for a few decades and we weren't doing anything about it because we were all caught up in our ourselves and caught up in the pace and the distraction that life brought us, maybe 20 months of being pulled apart from one another is enough for us to recognize that, you know, maybe there's a big reason why we don't feel so good after 20 months apart. And it's because we've been apart from the people that not only do we have deep, meaningful relationships, the people we love, you know, whether that's elderly people that we weren't able to see, whether that's our friends, whether it's our colleagues, but even we did a piece of research in Canada recently called the Canadian Social Connection Survey, and 65% of the people that you saw every day were not even people that you had planned on seeing. They weren't in your calendar. So during the pandemic, all those what we call casual collisions were wiped out of your life. And so we need to get back out. We need to help people get to the other side of the pandemic. We need to help people get off the couch and break some of the bad habits that we've built because the crisis and the epidemic will only grow greater if we don't do something about it. But because we've all experienced a little bit of what loneliness and isolation might have felt like because we were pulled away, maybe this is the wake-up call that we all needed. 
Why do you feel like people aren't making social and human connections more? That's a great question, Curtis. I'm not, I'm not sure I have all the answers, but I think, you know, we've been, we've been growing up over the last few decades in what I will call a dog eat dog world. It was, you know, every man for himself, we've created the most individualistic society in history. And as a result, you know, even pre technology and pre social media, it was already a bit of a competitive nature out there that, you know, everybody had to fight to, to get more of, of more of it for themselves, whatever it was for you, that could be money, that could be status, that could be stuff, it could be toys, it could be whatever. And then we had the advent of, of technology and, and certainly social media playing a critical role in this. You know, when you and I were kids, based on those deep soothing sounds of your voice, Curtis, I'm going to say you're old enough to remember when there used to be kids on the street, when there used to be people around that could, could play and the competitive set that I had were just those kids, the kids I saw every day at school. They were my neighbors I could see across the street and maybe my extended family who would come over for visits once in a while. But it's a real challenge if you are spending a lot of time on social media and you're not putting what's on social media in context. It's very easy, easy for us to become overwhelmed. And certainly if you're in a comparison mode, you're no longer just competing with the 10 or 12 or 20 kids that you saw every day or the, the parents across the street. You're now competing with the world. And I think this is actually even the evolution of loneliness because when I was a kid, we were just lonely. And now, or, or, sorry, I should say when we were kids, we were just bored. But when you got bored because there was only one TV in the house and if your brother or sister got it, you went outside and there was always kids to play with. The problem right now is that, you know, A, there's 10 screens, there's no kids outside. So that's not even an option for most people because everybody's inside watching some screen. And so this is where I believe loneliness is really capturing a lot of us is it's all these additional pressures and distractions that have been brought into our lives that we used to be able to handle, not because we were smarter back then, it's just it didn't exist. And so I think this is about the education of society. This is about recognizing that, look, the social platforms are not going to change their algorithms. They're not going to reduce their, their focus on the bottom line, which requires them to you know, feed us messages that keep us addicted. We are up against teams of behavioral psychologists who are working to create the addictions, whether you're a young person, an old person, a business person. And so, and because so many people are on it, you know, you look at small business people, it's the only option uh, for a lot of people to really get their message out there. And so the only solution is not counting on other people, but to look inwards and count on ourselves and educate and empower ourselves to make better decisions with our time. Pre-pandemic, the average person was spending 12 hours a day on screens. Early in the pandemic, I saw a stat that said it was up to 16 hours a day. Well, Curtis, if you sleep seven to eight hours a day and you're spending 16 hours on technology, I know what you don't have any more time left for in the day. And that's doing the thing that makes you probably most healthy, most happy, and certainly contributes to leading a more fulfilled life. And that's spending time with other people. Well, I'm glad you said that. And yes, I was one of those kids on the street that <laughs> stayed out playing, but it's the Gen Well Project anti-technology or do you feel like there's a way that we can use technology in a positive way to connect or you just against it all because I know there are some people that are Curtis it's a great question we are not anti-technology and I'm glad you asked that because I think it's a really important thing to clarify for people there is a hey there is a lot of beautiful things about technology and let's be very grateful for technology look what you and I are doing right now having a conversation. You're in Kansas, I'm in Toronto, Canada, and we're having a conversation free of charge over the, over the web. You know, that's a beautiful thing using Zoom as our, as our platform, but, but everything in balance, right? You know, those who spend, and even the research shows that minimal amounts of time, I think it's up to two hours a day, to be honest with you, on technology 
is deemed to be not terrible for you. But when you spend more time, and certainly when you spend time passively scrolling, technology is an amazing way for us to connect with people. Face-to-face human connection is what we are all about. We want to encourage people to find more time because most of us aren't spending enough time. But if you and I aren't able to see each other for a period of time because we got busy schedules or frankly, we live on the other side of the world, well, let's use technology as a great way to supplement the relationships that we do need to maintain and get back to face to face. And let's use it to share beautiful messages. Let's share it to to inspire people. Let's share messages that give us hope. And certainly coming out of the pandemic, we're going to need all of it. So technology is not all bad. It obviously helps us get work. We were able to work remotely during the global pandemic, but let's make sure that we keep it in balance and recognize what the research shows that, you know, the guy who spends or the girl who spends all day on technology and doesn't get time with with others face-to-face to put life in context, you know, those people don't tend to fare too well. And we want to make sure that we're giving that message so that people take the steps before they get sick we as a society are really good at waiting until people get sick before we try to help them. And the message of the Gen Well Project is, hey, let's help people build these healthy connection habits with their friends, their family, their neighbors, their colleagues, their classmates before they get sick. So that even if they do get sick, whether it's a flu or you break your leg or you have a heart attack or God forbid, you know, something tragic happens in your life in any, in any way, shape or form we're all going to get through those challenging times much better if we have a community of people around us. Yeah, they, they always say that if you don't have a website, people aren't even interested in you. So that just shows you right there. Mm. Talk about some of the challenges that you face starting the Gen Well Project. And what, what does it mean, like the GE? And is that like an acronym or something? Curtis, you, it's like I, I should have fed you all these questions. These are beautiful. So... First off, Gen Well is about generating wellness. You know, when we launched back in 2015, our name was originally called the Generator Project, and it was inspired by the summer blackout on the northeastern seaboard of the U.S. and Canada. 50 million people went without power for two to seven days, depending on where you were. And the inspiration for me was that night that of the black, the first night of the blackout. It was about 31 degrees. It was a beautiful night. It was in August, August. Uh, 13th, 14th, 2003. And after everybody got home and checked on their loved ones, we all got connected. We went out and talked to our neighbors and we went over to a friend's house. Obviously, when the power goes out, the fridges and the freezers are turned off. And so people pulled out all that food, all that thing, all the things they've been saving for a big event or a special occasion got pulled out of the fridge. All the ice cream got pulled out. You know, the beer got pulled out because you wanted to drink the beer before it got warm. And so people just started connecting. And and I talked to a lot of people, including a bunch of people on a street that I went over to a friend's house. And I walked out on the street and I said to everybody, hey, isn't this cool that, you know, you're all getting connected and you guys must know each other. And they all looked at me and said, no, 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 we don't know each other. And what stuck with me that night, Curtis, was just the fact that it took somebody to turn the power off for us to actually talk to our next door neighbor. And that just really speaks to just how busy, how fast paced and how distracted the world had become that we wouldn't even know in in Canada. And I think the numbers weren't far off in the U S 50% of people didn't know their next door neighbor's name. Well, that's not a good thing when we're trying to build stronger communities and bigger connections. And the research we did shows that just by knowing your neighbor, you reduce your likelihood of feeling lonely by three times Talking to strangers increases your likelihood of being happy by three times. And yet, as I say, nobody knows this information. But to your point, so we started off with the GenWell project and it was inspired, uh, the generator project, which was 500 generators went down in the uh, Northeastern United States. And that allowed us to generate great connections and conversations. And so the original name was really a reflection back on what inspired the movement. Whereas Gen Well, generating wellness is really about what our, what our goal is, what our mission is, is our goal is to help everybody generate better wellness for themselves and for the people around them, because that's how we, you know, enjoy life more. And when you ask the question about, 
you know, what are the challenges? The challenges I would say are that until the global pandemic, it's only now that people are waking up to what we call our social health. You know, for a long time, we've talked about physical health. More recently, people have talked about their mental health. But the reality is what we need to start talking about is our social health. Because mental health, a lot of people speak about things like gratitude and journaling and mindfulness and breathing techniques and even solitude um, as ways in which we can improve our mental health. The unfortunate thing is that most of those activities you can do alone. But when we talk about social health, it requires us to actually reach out to other people. And when you're struggling, that actually might be the toughest time for you to do that. And it's why the Genwell message is really focused not only on educating all of us on what we should do when we feel lonely or we feel disconnected or we might be struggling, but maybe an even bigger part of our message is to wake to educate everybody in society and wake everybody up as to the role each of us can play in the life of somebody else. You know, if, if you and I saw each other every Tuesday night for a beer and we've been doing that for two years or three years or, you know, maybe 20 years, Curtis, and then all of a sudden you didn't show up for a beer one night, that might be a good indicator to me that something's up if I haven't spoken to Curtis and he hasn't given me the heads up that he's not going to be there. I play hockey a couple times a week up here in Toronto. And, you know, you're used to seeing the same faces because it's preset in your schedule. You know when you need to be there. And when you don't see somebody after a period of time, you know, rather than just kind of, oh, Curtis isn't here, maybe somebody might say, hey, Curtis isn't here. You know what? After the game today, I'm going to give Curtis a call and check in on him, see how he's doing. I've had just in the last couple of weeks, I've had a few friends reach out. One lost a job. One's been diagnosed with cancer. One's going through a divorce. And I'm sure there's hundreds of thousands of people going through those challenges and more. And if we can all recognize the power of human connection in supporting people through these ups and downs that we're going to go through in our lives, we all have the power to be part of the solution to making the world a happier and healthier place. Life is never going to be easy. There's always going to be, you know, challenges along the way. But if we can build these relationships, build stronger social health habits before we get to the crisis, that to me is part of the solution for all of us to live happier and healthier lives. What a great message. Tell us about any current upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. A couple of things I'll tell you about we're working on in the uh, in in the workplace and then also on campuses for universities and colleges. But first and foremost, I want to encourage everybody to follow us on our social media channels. Again, to the message about not everything on social is bad. Every day we share information, research, tips, tools and ideas on how people can start building healthier connection habits starting today. At the end of the day, we have to stop waiting until we get to the crisis and we need to count on other people to be part of the solution. The government, you know, the system, the organizations who try to be there to help us, and, and oftentimes they are, but we have, to, we have to get ahead of this. We have to encourage people to be proactive in their own lives by recognizing the importance of their social health and taking action. So that's the first thing I want to say. You know, from a workplace standpoint, as we head back to the new workplace, the hybrid workplace, businesses and employees are going to struggle as we don't have, as we've struggled through this whole pandemic, how we've struggled with the lack of connection with one another. You know, the research is clear that even having a best friend at the office, having a relationship that you can go to in the office increases your productivity by seven times. But the same health benefits that we have at home happen at work as well. Because when you spend eight to 10 hours a day at the office, isn't it a good idea to have some comforting relationships there that can support you when things aren't going well at the office? And the two strongest correlations between burnout are the two things that are most strongly correlated to burnout are a lack of sleep and a lack of social connection or loneliness. And yet again, I would argue that some people aren't familiar with those that information. Sleep, I think we've heard, but I think a lot of people might think it's budgets or it might be stressful 
you know, timelines, or it might be, you know, complicated business structure, you know, but conversations and connections can help you through all those challenges and can help you build the resilience. And that's a message that we're really trying to put out there working through workplaces. We have a new program. People can find out more about it on our website at genwellproject.org. And it's called Heads Up. And it's a student program. We're trying to launch it at colleges and universities, frankly, across Canada or around the world. You know, we've got some posters and social posts that are really helping to educate students on four things or inspire them, I would say. Heads up, you know, get your head out of your phone because that's the first point of, of making connections with other people is looking them in the eye and, you know, just saying hello. Heads up about the importance of your social health as a part of your mental health and physical health. Because, you know, if you think of mental health and physical health, they are symptoms of something not going right. Whereas the action that we all need to be thinking more of is our social health and building those supportive relationships. So Heads Up is about getting kids to lift up their heads out of their phone, be more conscious about their social health, understand the impact that having a conversation with somebody else can have on them. So whether you think about a young person or a senior or somebody who's struggling, a simple pick up the phone or face-to-face connection can have all the difference in the world. And finally, as we come out of this global pandemic, Curtis, I would argue that we all need to be a little more heads up that we're in this together and that, you know, the best thing we can all do is start to build some relationships with whoever it is, friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, classmates, you know, maybe it's a a guitar club that you belong to. Maybe it's a book club. Maybe it's a wine club. I don't care. I don't care what the club is, but at the end of the day, rather than just thinking about the reason you go to the club is for the activity recognize that, you know, there's another reason why you go to the book club and that's to meet people. And that's why you sit around for 30 minutes after you finish reading the book and talking about the book and you just connect because that's actually what I think the bigger benefit of all those clubs is, is having that routine in our calendars to know that every week or two weeks or every month, we're going to go to that club meeting. We're going to go to that group of people that have similar interests to us. And so if we can help educate people on all those things, you know, we can make it happier. And our young people are struggling right now. In Canada, there was a recent study about students in universities and colleges, and it says 81% of them are feeling extremely stressed and lonely. And so we need to help them. We need to help everybody. And and it really is the message of the Genwell Project that we are all part of the solution. And just by picking up our heads and having a few more conversations, saying hello to a few more strangers, saying, you know, good morning to your neighbor, each one of those actions can make a huge difference. And it may not be one day, but if we make this a habit and we do it every day, I'm telling you, Curtis, we truly can make the world a happier and healthier place, one connection at a time. We definitely can. Now you mentioned genwellproject.org. Give out the rest of your contact information, social media. You have any social media accounts? Yep. We got Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, what's the other Facebook. If they just Genwell, it's either at Genwell or at Genwell Project. It's actually Genwell Pro or the Genwell Project, depending on each one, but they'll find it. Website, genwellproject.org. And my email is Pete at genwellproject.org. If anybody wants to reach out to have further conversation. You know, we do a lot of corporate speaking. We do speaking at community groups. Our goal is to share this as far and wide as possible. And, and true, and, and we do a lot of work at schools sharing this message as well. So if anybody's interested in having us in to do a, a keynote or a workshop, we'd love the opportunity to have a conversation because the quicker we can get this message out, the quicker we can have an impact on the lives of the people around us. You have any final thoughts or is there anything that I might have left out that you want to touch on? No, nothing that I've left out, Curtis, but I just want to say this. It's people like you that give people like me the opportunity to share this message with your community. And as we kind of touched on at the top, you know, it is the opportunity to connect. Even you and I getting connected here, you know, and for me being able to share I've done all the talking, which I apologize for. That's just, you know, unfortunately, it's just who I am. And obviously the movement and and the topic tonight, but the opportunity to meet people like us, not like us, people from different parts of the country, different parts of the world, 
this is actually part of what it's all about. And so I just want to say thanks for the opportunity to share the message. And, and thank you for the really the spot on questions, because I think you hit on a lot of the key things. And I hope people really enjoyed the conversation. And I hope they'll take this message and do something with it today. And the first thing we always ask people to do is call one person, you know, call one more person tomorrow. When you hear this message, call somebody. If you're listening to it in the middle of the day, call a friend, check in on them, see how they're doing. And you never know, that might be the difference maker in somebody's day, whether it's getting them through today, maybe it's getting them through the week, maybe it's getting them through the month, but every one of us has the power to make a difference. So I just want to say thanks, Curtis. Well, there's definitely no need to apologize. I tell all my guests the show <laughs> is about you and your message is not about me. I'm just the facilitator. You do a and, great job. And listeners, jamwellproject.org. And as Pete said, call a person when you hear this message make sure that you call and talk to them you might even help them get through the next five minutes also be sure to follow rate review share this episode to as many people as possible after listening because there are a lot of people out there that's lonely and pete gave some great advice and android listeners go to the google play store and download the living the dream with curveball podcast app thank you so much for joining me today pete Thank you, Curtis. Really appreciate it. Take care of yourself. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream. Dream.